Uh, and next up, we have Professor Zhao Wang, who's uh, had some recent work combining um, metabolic labeling with imaging RNAs and uh, able to produce temporal information as well as spatial information. And uh, we're excited to hear today about her talk on uh, translation uh, in imaging data. So uh, yeah, without further ado, Professor Zhao Wang. Thanks very much for the introduction. And I apologize that I couldn't be there in person today. Um, so let me just share my screen. Um, yeah, so today, um, I hope to share with you our recent work on spatially resolved profile, in situ profiling of MRA translation. Um, so as a brief introduction of our scientific interest, uh, our lab is very much interested in uh, profiling the MRA life cycle in eukaryotes. Uh, as shown here, uh, although protein are the final products to um, perform biological functions, uh, there is like a very intricate layers of post-transcriptional gene regulation uh, as detailed here, including processing, localization, translation, decay, and a lot of structure and RNA protein interaction related uh, regulation events. So all of these um, complicated cycle of regulation finally contribute to precisely control when and where to make proteins inside the cells. So um, just taking neuronal cells as an example, there is like a very, um, very well regulated localized translation events inside the cells. Uh, for example, as shown um, in this figure, the neuron typically has a branched structures of dendrites and axons, uh, which can extend it for uh, quite a long distance to make connections with other neurons. And in order to actually make proteins at the terminals of the neurons, which are called synapse, to enable efficient um, local regulation of synaptic connection, which are the uh, foundations of memory formation, there is a uh, a very well regulated localized translation where the RNAs are, trans, uh, are translocated in dendrites to make a protein locally. Um, this is such uh, this type of localized translation uh, first uh, very important for neuronal function, but behind those like uh, uh, tissue level function, it reflects one principles of protein synthesis, which is uh, first they have to be. Uh, economical uh, because if the neuron cells can transport the mRNA inside the uh, synapse, they can make uh, many copies of a protein, which will be more economical than transport um, many copies of a protein directly from the cell bodies to the dendrites. And more importantly, um, this mRNA can make protein on demand, uh, which can tune the synaptic connections of individual synapses more efficiently. And besides those synaptic related functions, it, uh, there is also widely um, recognized the patterns of localized translation um, at uh, all these subcellular organelles. So in total, in order to better understand when and where MRI translation happens and how those events contribute to shape uh, the cellular proteomes, we definitely need um, like a subcellular result profiling. And furthermore, I think I don't need to stress more about uh, the necessity of uh, uh, single cell result profiling. But uh, in addition, I also want to zoom out regarding the spatial scale, just putting the single cells in um, the spatial local environment in a biological tissue it is also necessary for us to understand um, the tissue morphology and what has a cellular neighborhood of a cell in order to better understand how those gene regulation events about protein synthesis actually contribute uh, to a larger scale of uh, a larger scale function of a cellular community inside the biological tissue. And the most established way to study MRA translation, uh, it's uh, ribosome profiling. And basically, 
uh, people will purify the so-called ribosome bound mRNA in, and then further fragment them to get these ribosome footprints and subject to the downstream uh, next generation sequencing. And so this way we can selectively uh, enrich ribosome bound mRNA as an estimation of a protein synthesis. At the same time, we can also, uh, people will also adding the RNA input uh, where they can also quantify the total copy numbers and the sequence of the RNA molecules. And uh, by compare the ribosome bound fraction versus the mRNA input, uh, we can efficiently evaluate uh, the so-called translation efficiency of each gene as a measure of uh, how potent the mRNA or how efficient the mRNA can make proteins. Um, so this is the most established way of doing um, protein synthesis estimation at a genome scale. However, uh, the limitation is that we lose all, because it requires biochemical purification, we lose the spatial and the single cell information. So because of that, we wonder how we can achieve ribosome profiling in CQ. Um, so in order to do this, um, we first ask whether we could achieve just RNA profiling in situ. So uh, this is a can trace back to our more uh, prior work on the, the development of 3D in situ transcriptomics. So um, there is a spatial transcriptomics has been really powerful tools for uh, enabling comprehensive profiling of RNA um, transcription and the overall landscape of the transcriptome inside the tissues. So in StarMap, in order to uh, enable multiplex the gene profiling, we have designed a pair of probes. Uh, we call it a snail probes, which essentially contain a padlock and a primer. Uh, and when both of them hybridize to the same mRNA, the signal can be uh, amplified through ligation and rolling circle amplification. And after this step, we also further embed uh, those uh, ampli amplified cDNA into a hydrogel tissue network to make the whole tissue transparent. And finally, we can use in situ sequencing reactions to decode the barcode for individual probes uh, in order to quantify, um, identify and quantify each as a copy number of each gene. So build on this foundational work, we finally ask, can we actually achieve selective profiling of a translating mRNA? Uh, in order to do so, we design a probe, uh, but this time we have three probes as one set. So as shown here, uh, in addition to the padlock and the primer, uh, we also design a third probe, we call it a splint probe. And uh, we design the, the splint probe in a way they selectively hybridize to the ribosomal, uh, sorry, the ribosomal RNA of the ribosome, which means uh, we can selectively targeting either the uh, like the 40S or the 60S subunits of the ribosome as a selective um, selection for ribosome bound mRNA. So only when all three probes together, uh, we can have amplified signals to generate DNA amplicons. Uh, if there is a free mRNA without the ribosome nearby, there will be no amplification. And then we can uh, substantially, uh, subsequently um, conduct hydrogel tissue embedding and in situ sequencing. So as the very first step of benchmarking, we first test uh, the signal to noise ratio of the triprobe design uh, to see whether they can indeed selectively detecting ribosome bound mRNA. Uh, as shown here, uh, if we remove one probe at a time, we got uh, almost zero signals. Uh, that is to say, like this triprobe design can really help us to profile um, mRNA that have closely bound by the ribosome. Okay, then as the next validation, we also try to design probes targeting either a translating mRNA, uh, which is beta actin B, and as well as two other non-coding RNA, MLAT1 and VT RNA uh, inside the nucleus or cytosol respectively. Um, as you can see here, 
only when uh, we design probes targeting messenger RNA, we can got um, like significant ribomap signals. But when we are uh, detecting this non-coding RNA, there is very little signals. This is again validating that ribomap can indeed selectively detecting translating mRNA. And after this step, we move forward uh, with uh, multiplex detections in uh, human cells. So we choose to ben further benchmark our method using um, this uh, FUCCS stable line in human HeLa cells. Um, so basically, FUCCI cell line can give us the ground truth of cell cycle progression um, by these fluorescent protein indicators. And uh, we um, compose the gene leaks of 981 genes, which including uh, cell cycle markers and other um, RNAs that may have uh, interesting spatial localization. And we conduct a pairwise the mapping of RebelMap and StarMap in order to uh, evaluate first uh, um, whether we, the RebelMap can be sensitive enough to uh, characterize the cell cycle progression. So as you can see here, as expected, uh, the star map signals, they are everywhere inside the cells, whereas the rebel map signals, they are um, predominantly in the cytosol. And uh, uh, when we, after we collecting these uh, data sets, we then uh, conduct a uh, single cell data analysis as other like a single cell based uh, uh, proteomics and uh, uh, transcriptomics approach. Uh, as you can see here, um, when we compare the cell cycle classification using either the transcriptome profile measured by StarMap or the translatome profile measured by the RibomaP, both of them agree very well with the ground choose uh, cell cycle indicators, which means although we are profiling a subset of the transcriptome that are actively making proteins, um, they are still sensitive enough to allow us to uh, accurately classify them into different cell cycle stage. So after all these benchmarking efforts, we are ready to make more uh, scientific discoveries. Um, so one unique feature we can extract is uh, um, co-localization of RNA of, from different genes. Because we profiled um, not more than 900 genes simultaneously, uh, we can start to evaluating uh, what's the likelihood for two um, genes to co-localize together for translation? Um, and for these purposes, we conducted the analysis of gene-to-gene -gene co-localization uh, probabilities. As shown here, um, the left uh, heat map is showing uh, the pairwise classification of gene-to-gene -gene module uh, co-localization patterns from which we discovered the five gene, uh, interesting gene modules. We call it a localized translation gene modules. And uh, on the right is the star, uh, the corresponding star map analysis. As you can see, um, those spatial patterns are less obvious. Um, and uh, among these uh, five localized translation gene modules, we recovered um, the ER localized translation as shown in module two and the module four, uh, they are essentially corresponding to genes that are localized for, uh, at ER for membrane location or the secretum. Um, but what's more is that we also discovered um, interesting co-localized patterns for um, mitotic spindle complexes as well as the polysome um, which is the ribosomal uh, protein uh, modules. So both of them share the same, uh, share like a one interesting uh, phenomenon as they are both big protein complexes. Um, previous study have shown that um, there could uh, genes, but whatever result, uh, is that maybe it's a common principle when uh, big protein complexes are uh, supposed to assemble, the most economical and accurate way is to localize the translation of the corresponding messenger RNA. So whenever the 
this and the protein is being made, they have relevant subunits nearby. So all of these analyses are just conducted by pure counting the neighborhood of individual RNA molecules without any subset uh, really tell us like beyond um, the known subcellular organelles, there could be other way of organizing um, the protein synthesis just uh, by their functional relevance. Okay. Um, I ribomab uh, to biological tissues. So to this end, we applied it. Uh, we composed uh, more than 5,000 gene list and apply them into um, mouse brain tissues. Um, so, so we first uh, compared genes with established uh, uh, ground truth of in situ hybridization. As you can see here, they agree very well. Um, and the second, we then uh, utilizing this single cell translatomic profile to conduct the cell typing. Again, um, the concern is, okay, we are only profiling a small fraction of the transcriptome. Are they still sensitive enough to allow us to uh, robustly classify cell types? As shown here, um, we actually um, have a very high resolution of cell typing uh, measured by RebelMap, which means uh, at least the, the overall translation profile or the protein file at a gate it's still reflecting the translation of a cell type markers are relative genes. Uh, to allow us to uh, have these stable cell type of classifications. Um, and um, this is a zoom in wheel of um, the spatial organization of individual cell types. Um, uh, in this map, individual colors representing different cell types. And as you can see here, they, they also agree very well with our knowledge of the spatial distribution of relevant cell types. Okay. But then again, the question after this, uh, all this benchmarking, uh, we then ask what's new we can learn. Um, and I think the previous talks already um, shown that sometimes if we really want to dissect the different steps of gene regulation, or we try to measure different modality of spatial information, uh, the best way to do so is cutting adjacent tissue slides. So that's what we did. Um, so for mouse brain, we cut adjacent brain uh, slides, one for rebel map, the other for star map. And then we can do this comparative in translation efficiency for individual genes. Okay. okay. So um, to this end, we first compared the rebel map and the star map, how well they agree with each other. And uh, uh, what we found is there's one particular cell type, which is oligodendrocytes. Uh, the rebel map signal does not agree very well with the star map. They show the least uh, correlation. Uh, but on the other side, it also means they may have very interesting translational regulations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we uh, also observe uh, a less level extent of agreement in the fibro uh, uh, tracks uh, of the brain tissue slice. Uh, this is again where the oligodendrocytes are uh, enriched. So um, all of this point out to us that oligodendrocytes might be a very interesting cell type that have very strong translational regulation. So uh, in case you are not familiar with the oligodendrocytes, I just want to reintroduce what, uh, what they do. Um, so if we think uh, an individual neuronal cell is like an electronic wire, especially the axon region is like an electronic wire, and the oligo what the oligodendrocytes do is they wrap around the axons of neurons, which means they are adding the insulating layers uh, for um, to facilitate the electric electric signal transduction from the cell body to the axons of neuronal cells, and inside the brain, uh, there are typically three types of cell types really relevant to, for oligodendrocytes. Uh, the green cell types the, is the so called oligodendrocytes. Then there is also um, premature uh, oligodendrocytes as well as fully matured oligodendrocytes. 
uh, especially the later is especially enriched in the fiber tracks. And um, after that, we then calculate uh, the relative translation efficiency of genes that are expressed in across all these three different cell types. Through this um, type of analysis, we again discover one inch, very interesting gene modules where, uh, as you can see here through the heat map, among these two different types of oligodendrocytes, they show very similar star map profile, which means if we count in the RNA copy numbers, they are similar. However, um, these have very high signal in rebel map, and after we calculate the relative translation efficiency, we can see they are very highly translated in uh, the matured oligodendrocytes in the fiber tracks. And all of the, these genes, the actual myelination uh, process, um, which means those are in, indeed uh, the upper-regulated um, gene modules directly relevant to our cellular functions. I'm just taking one example, uh, cloud in 11, a tight junction associated protein, because when the oligodendrocytes, they form these multiple layers of insulating uh, um, myelation, um, they also have gap, gap junctions uh, to connect them. And this type of uh, clouding 11 is exactly the protein that associating with these gap junctions, which means only uh, the oligodendrocytes that are actually actively making these myelations will need this protein. And as you can see here, uh, if we look at the star map, this protein, they broadly expressed in all oligodendrocytes and sometimes also in other cells. However, if we look at the rebel map, see, you know, they are extremely highly expressed, uh, which means they have elevated translation efficiency in um, male latent oligodendrocytes and also has a higher translation efficiency in fiber tracks. Um, so this is just like as one example to showcase um, that um, the, there is indeed a very strong translation regulation. And when we able to measure translation efficiency at a single cell resolution, we better dissect different cell types. Um, of course, oligodendrocytes is the very first one that we carefully examined, but there are actually many, many other uh, interesting translation regulation across other different cell types. And then uh, finally, I just want to go back to the point of subcellular localized translation. Um, as I first introduced, uh, this localized translation phenomenon is critical for the function of neurons. But there are also other cell types like astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia. They are all also very branched. Uh, they also have very branched cell morphology, and they are also relevant. Uh, mRNA have localized translation in those. Uh, so-called processes or branches. Um, so because we have very high spatial resolution, we can actually classify the RNA molecules into two categories, either in the cell body or the outside the cell body in the processes or um, branches. And uh, um, just uh, for the ease of visualization, all the RNA uh, that are localized in the cell bodies, we label them as uh, blue and all these like processes in rich the RNA, uh, we label them as red. And uh, after this type of um, segmentation, we can then uh, calculate uh, the ratio of uh, uh, RNA uh, distribution in soma versus in processes. And that way we can systematically discover what are the genes that have preferred localized translation in processes. Um, as shown here, um, we have uh, again found many um, synaptic function related genes enriched uh, in these like processes, which has been agreed very well with the previous uh, literatures. But what, what's more, we can uh, directly visualize where they are inside the uh, mouse brain tissues. And again, among those genes, we found uh, this like uh, um, highly expressed uh, um, ribosomal protein encoding mRNA. 
uh, which is like a co correlated with uh, what we observed in HeLa cells. Uh, maybe for ribosomal proteins, they indeed tends to co-localize for translation. Um, and uh, when we look at this, like uh, soma enriched genes, and again, many of them are ER localized translation uh, for uh, either plasmic membrane protein or um, like a secretome. So this is uh, as expected because um, like a uh, um, ER is uh, is almost uh, strictly localized in cell bodies. Okay, so um, this is uh, again showing like what's the extra information we can learn from uh, spatially resolved translation profiling. Um, as a summary, um, through the development of RebelMap, uh, we can uh, simultaneously profile thousands of genes regarding their translation status, uh, both in cell culture and in biological tissue slides. And uh, uh, from there, we can detect uh, cell cycle regulated genes and also subcellular localized translation events in cells and tissues. Um, and we can also further discover was the uh, interesting cell type specific translation regulation. Um, and uh, of course, we haven't got a chance to go deeper into the mechanism, like why the same gene could have very different translation efficiency across different cell types in the cell stage. There must be, um, for example, RNA binding proteins and many other uh, interesting mechanisms to uh, regulate all these events. Um, and finally, um, I want to introduce another method that we developed to uh, utilize metabolic labeling and combine that with in-situ sequencing to uh, systematically profile uh, mRNA transcription, export, uh, translocation, and degradation. Um, so um, today I haven't, uh, because of the time limits, I hope to just zoom in one story um, to showcase like uh, the most relevant uh, work regarding um, protein synthesis step, which will be directly relevant uh, to the proteomics. Um, but if you're interested, um, I'm also happy to um, chat offline about our other work to uh, systematically profile the kinetic landscape of um, mRNA life cycle, where again, we discovered many co-regulated uh, RNA, if they share similar kinetic parameters regarding their synthesis and degradation rates, they are also often uh, functionally, functionally related. Um, so together, I, th I think through um, the new wave of development of, of in-situ sequencing-based approach to systematically profile the whole life cycle of mRNA, we will achieve better understanding um, how the transcript, uh, how the transcriptome will eventually uh, contribute to the nascent proteome, and which will be further uh, final landscape of the proteome, and uh, how that uh, gene regulation process will be um, relevant to cellular function and collectively for tissue functions. Okay, so um, with that, I just want to thank. Um, the uh, two heroes of this two work, um, especially Dr. Hu Zheng, Jia Hao, uh, Jing Yi, and Kang Yan Zhe Fang. Um, so they are the major uh, people that are making uh, these two tools development happen. And I also want to thank everyone from my lab and the funding agency. Um, and thanks very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Questions? I have, uh, I'm Nikolai Slavov. I have at least half a dozen of questions, but I'm gonna start by asking a couple because I would imagine other people would have questions. But uh, what one, one technical question is, what is the efficiency of capturing the ribosome density with ribomap? Uh, how does it compare to doing sequencing of just RNA, not measuring ribosome density? Um, that's a great question. So um, currently we don't have... 
Right. So um, currently, because we still rely on uh, imaging to do all this profiling, which means uh, if they have multiple ribosome bound to the same mRNA, uh, we may not be able to quantify them. Uh, however, uh, we have done very careful comparison with our results versus uh, the ribosome profiling, sequencing-based ribosome profiling results, we see a very good positive correlation. Then we try to go back and think about why uh, we couldn't optically resolve one um, ribosome versus multiple, but what, how that like correlation happens. Then um, the, the, our current understanding is that um, our detection of the uh, like ribosome Ribosome bound MRI is the efficiency is hundred uh, percent. In ribosome on a there are higher chance as to detect them. Uh, so that in general we see a very good positive correlation between our results and the established ribosome profiling results. Uh, and as a future direction, we want to combine with the super and potentially other synthetic biology tools, so better quantify exactly how many ribosome per single molecule we can detect. Uh, but in the current version, we um, it's uh, it's very hard to have a very quantitative uh, conclusion. It's like how many ribosome per mRNA. Yeah, thank you. I, I think what you're able to do is already amazing. It's it's incredible the multimodal abilities that you're adding on top of just measuring RNA. I think that's very, very exciting. So one more biology oriented question that they have before I cede the microphone is uh, for the enrichment of uh, translation of ribosomal proteins in the cell processes that you observe. And potentially this might shed some light on a very interesting question about uh, translating ribosomal proteins in synapses and in processes and how this relates to the model of ribosomes actually being assembled in the nucleus, because that would require to transport the ribosomal proteins from the process to the nucleus and then transport the ribosomes back. Do you think that your data uh, provides evidence one way or another uh, on, on that discussion of how ribosomes are assembled? Yeah, um, that's a great point. That's actually the biggest mystery uh, because it's not that observed in not localized translation for ribosomal proteins. Uh, however, the canonical is that the picture of ribosome uh, biogenesis is supposed to assemble in nucleus. So why if all the ribosomes are already assembled in the nucleus, then they're is why they have to synthesize new ribosomal protein at the synapse. This uh, one purpose for is that a uh, one hypothesis is that uh, maybe is a pre assembled for the ribosome. They are not fully mature subunits, so that mature ribosome be uh, more efficient to synapse because all this like a fully matured ribosome, maybe they will just trapped in the cytosol and then they have a specialized ribosome that will be further in a translation repressive stage state so that they will stay inactive until they are being transported to synapse so that they can locally uh, adding the remaining missing factors to make a fully functional ribosome. So that's one hypothesis. And there's a second hypothesis is that uh, the ribosome is already fully mature and function to so assemble nucleolus. However, when they enter into the cytosol, especially along their traveling to synapse, there will be some turnover of uh, ribosome subunits, especially the subunits on the surface of the ribosome. So yeah, so that means which means the rabbit is still constantly under maintenance. Um, so I think uh, they are just like <laughs> both hypotheses point out, uh, pointing to uh, the concept of so-called ribosome heterogeneity, uh, which uh, they are like uh, ribosomes at like existing in the cells. They they have non-identical protein compo uh, 
components, even non-RNA components. That was the function uh, at a different subcellular loci. Yeah. Thank you. It's very exciting to have these data. It also adds so, to um, interesting. In short, we are now 100% sure. <laughs> Jeroen Krigsfeld also had interesting data indicating using pulse chase. Uh, yeah, I, I think we, we, we have this. The synthesis of ribosomal proteins at synapses that he shared with us a few years back. Right, I do see. So shall I start? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I feel um, like uh, I, I wish to have equivalent spatial proteomics profiling so that people can uh, to trace, uh, you know, the uh, temporal kinetics of the nascent proteome. We may overlay our information uh, with the direct pro uh, proteomics profile to trace the history of the proteins in addition to the RNA. Hi, um, thank you. So I have like two questions. One is very small question about like the resolution of the um, rival map. The second one is closely related to the previous uh, question that uh, Nikolai asked. It's about um, the local translation of um, RNA uh, of proteins in a synthesis of neurons. And we know that like some groups have mentioned um, they, I mean, in general, it's hard to detect ribosomes in um, like axons in, in neurons, for example. And some group have evident, evidence showing there are some mono uh, ribosome can be detected, but in a low level relatively compared to the um, polyribosome. So I'm wondering whether using the rival, tab, uh, rival map technique, uh, like how much uh, local translation signal you have detected in axons or, or dendrite in general. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, um, both are great questions. I like the second one, <laughs> uh, since we are looking at here, uh, uh, differentiation versus X-ray, um, I cannot will uh, uh, axonal RNA and uh, the, like growth cone, um, but it's still uh, unclear whether um, that it will be a lot of uh, like significant axon translation in matured neurons. Um, so in our the uh, then I can answer the first question about the spatial resolution. Uh, our spatial resolution is uh, the spatial resolution of a confocal microbe, uh, which is around a few hundred nanometer. So under that resolution, it's insufficient to differentiate dendrite versus axon because inside the intact brain is like a fully uh, packed. Uh, it's very closely packed. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two ways we may be able to answer this question to differentiate versus axon and translation. It's uh, uh, the first use expansion microscope coupled with the super resolution to uh, achieve, for example, less than 10 nanometer resolution. And in that case, we can uh, dissect the um, dendritic RNA from axon. axon. Um, so that's, that is one way of detection. And the second uh, thought, we have thought about it, but we haven't really do it. It's uh, uh, we could first do rival map, but partially maintain the membrane structure uh, through uh, selective chemical fixes to, to fix the mem partially the membrane structure. Then after we conduct the rebel map and partially reserve the membrane structure, we can again con uh, like do some like a heavy metal staining uh, for, electron micro for electron microscope so that under a like much higher resolution, 